Hey everyone, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Brandon Rodriguez. And my name is Lyle Tavernier. Thanks for joining us. We both work at the uh, education department at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and we're excited to talk to you guys today about uh, an opportunity to kind of code along with us. So what we're gonna do is start with some basics on how it is that we've been using coding and computer science, mostly to explore Mars thus far. Although of course, um, as JPL has missions all over the solar system, coding and computer science are, are really the crux, are critical to all of the missions that we have. But under the guise of Mars, under the theme of Mars today, we're uh, going to kind of walk through a couple of the most recent developments and then kick off an activity alongside with you guys. We'll also take a lot of time for questions in case you guys want to learn more or there are things that you're wondering in your classrooms as we work together. So with that being said, we'll jump right in and I'm gonna share a few slides with you guys to kind of set the stage for us. So, as you guys should be able to see here, um, one of the things that uh, we really like to start with when we think about coding and uh, roving around on Mars is that historically we've been doing this for a long time now. So as you guys can see here, this is a selfie taken by the Curiosity rover. Uh, Curiosity has been driving on Mars now successfully for over a decade, which means that while it's been doing incredible science and continues to do incredible science, uh, it's also a little bit outdated and certainly getting damaged by uh, a, a pretty rough terrain on the Martian surface. Uh, if you're able to see a close look, you'll, you'll be able to tell that the wheels on the uh, uh, Curiosity rover are starting to get really damaged, being that there are no you know, gentle roads or paved platforms for us to drive on. So in response to that, uh, as of last year, now we've had the Perseverance rover, which has uh, successfully landed as of uh, last February. And as you can see here is really similar in a lot of ways, like the chassis, the body, uh, all, all very similar, um, very uh, kind of cool updates in the technology, of course, because as being 10 years later, now all of a sudden we have the more cutting edge technology. And hopefully we get another 10 years of this uh, rover as well and can kind of you know, continue this path moving forward. You might also see that the Perseverance rover is looking back at a, a buddy it brought along with it, which is actually the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, the Perseverance rover effectively brought with it this small device kind of uh, on the uh, on the undercarriage, which it dropped and kind of you know allowed it to land softly on those little uh, little skinny legs, and then it drove away and was looking back at it. So maybe if we look at this picture one more time, you can see the the uh, tread marks from the wheels as we drove uh, uh, after dropping the Ingenuity helicopter, and the uh, mast cam is looking back at it to see, hey, we successfully deployed the helicopter in hopes of getting the first uh, powered flight on another planet. So the view that the rover sees, that Perseverance sees, looks like this. As we kind of start testing and powering up the Ingenuity helicopter, uh, this is really an amazing device, uh, a truly uh, just a, a technological breakthrough and really was a, a pilot technology, right? This is the, the first time that this has been done and has really led to some, some amazing results. Um, the helicopter in itself is, very, very light, very, very small. Um, but you can imagine the, the difficulty of flying in a place where the atmosphere is so thin. So being able to get the lift to be able to raise a helicopter is very difficult. And of course, as is going to be the theme for today, that the ability to fly is certainly not done by joystick, right? And I, I hope that we can kind of convey to you guys uh, at the very end of today that you leave knowing that when we talk about driving or flying on Mars, this is not done in the way perhaps you play a video game. This is not done in real time. In fact, it's all coding, it's all computer science to send commands upward. Uh, and the rover or Ingenuity, they receive these uh, codes and execute them um, at their time. So they know when to deploy, but we can't actually do it in real time. Uh, from 250 million miles away. So the challenges here are that we have to make up the distance with really good computer science. So with that kind of being said, Lyle's gonna lead us through a little bit of an activity today on 
uh, writing the code for a helicopter so that you too can fly on Mars. Great, thanks so much, Brandon. Um, if you go ahead and unshare your screen, we'll uh, bring up our video again, thanks so much. Uh, as Brandon mentioned, this is not like playing a video game. And part of the reason is because Mars is so far away that even at light speed, it takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes to send a signal to Mars. And then to get a return signal, you have to double that amount of time uh, for the trip back. So it would not be very, very wise to drive a rover or fly a helicopter by commanding it with a joystick to go forward because you'd have to wait and wait and wait for that signal. And then you'd have to wait and wait and wait for that signal to come back. So, as Brandon mentioned, these are codes that are sent in sequence that we send to the rover or to the helicopter and they execute those commands. Now, that works great for uh, flying a helicopter or driving a rover on Mars. But if you're doing something like uh, coding a game to fly a Mars helicopter, you actually don't want that delay because it wouldn't be very fun to tell the rover to drive forward and then you sit and you wait for five minutes and then you see, well, you don't see because now you have to wait another five minutes for the rover to send the signal back to tell you that it came back. So in the example that we're going to do, we're going to uh, we're going to cheat a little and we're going to create a rover, uh, excuse me, a helicopter video game that you can control. But if you want to make it a little bit more realistic and you want to get a little bit more advanced in your coding, you could take the helicopter game and adapt it so that you give it a series of commands and you press go. And then once you do that, it carries out the sequence. That's a little more complex. We're not going to get into that today, but I think that that would be a nice little um, extension or add-on that you could do uh, once you get comfortable with flying the helicopter in the game. So we've done a couple things. Um, I am going to put in the chat a link to where you can actually get started on this game. And what we've done, we're going to start using a, a, a program called Scratch. It's a free visual programming language. And when you go to the link that I put in the chat, you'll get to a page that looks like this. And essentially what I've done is I have, whoop, whoop, clicking on the wrong screen, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing, there we go. Uh, what I've done is I've created a Martian environment where you can see uh, a Mars helicopter on the ground, you can see the Martian atmosphere and you can see the ground. But as of right now, this game does nothing. And what you're going to do, or what I'm gonna challenge you to do is to create some code. And if you click on see inside, you're gonna see different blocks over here that will allow you to uh, command the rover, and, excuse me, command the helicopter to move. And that's the first step that we wanna do because when the Perseverance dropped the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, the first thing that the helicopter did was a test flight that went up and then came back down. We just wanted to make sure that it worked. Um, so that's gonna be the first challenge. And you've got a couple options. You can do this now um, while we're talking, if you wanna come back and revisit this um, challenge afterward, once you've learned a little bit more about the helicopter and how we built it and how we tested it and how it operates, you can certainly do that. Uh, but that's step one in your challenge. If you are maybe a little more advanced um, in your coding skills and you're thinking, well, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to do a block coding game, we have a few different options as well. So I'm going to put, again, a link in the chat where you can find a Mars rover driving game. Um, and this uses Python, is that correct? Yep. So if you're familiar with the Python coding language, you can use that one. Um, and then we also have a code a Mars landing challenge that you can do as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but this one is also in Python. Yep. So we've got a couple different opportunities for you to uh, try out some coding challenges. Um, and I'm saying, I'm putting these links in the chat. If you're watching the recording later, uh, these will be in the description as well. So you'll be able to click the description um, of the video to see where these links are. So I'm just going to leave it here and give you an opportunity to try some different things. If you are struggling, don't worry, we're going to come back and we'll look at some uh, basic controls to get you at least off the ground. And then from there, I think if you had not been able to figure it out, you'll then be able to program some controls to move the helicopter around a little bit. So that's where we're going to start. Um, if you are doing um, a fantastic job on your coding and you're getting ahead, um, what I'm going to suggest is 
that you will then go to this website right here. And I'll put the link in the chat because what this will do is it will give you some additional challenges. So beyond getting up off the ground, you're going to then be faced with some challenges like add a takeoff location. So where do you want the uh, helicopter to be at the start? Um, so again, I'll put this link in there. So if, as we're talking about the helicopter, you have already figured out how to code it to move around, you can um, get a little bit more advanced on there. So I'm going to switch it back to us, and Brandon is going to move forward with a little bit more about the helicopter. Yeah, so as you guys can see, we actually have a ton of options for coding activities for students and teachers alike. So if you want to do this as a class um, at another time together, uh, if you have some students who are uh, you know, really coding rock stars and are, are really interested in, in more advanced uh, activities, we have those for you as well. But for today, we're really going to work together on just the basics of Scratch and this helicopter to, to get us all started. So please feel free to, to continue to tinker with the link, uh, the first link that Lyle sent, because that background is already made for you and you guys are ready to just kind of dive into to the guts of the code and be able to start to play around. Um, while we're doing that, I'll show you guys just a couple more things about the helicopter, um, including uh, a couple of videos. Um, the kind of the, the thing I wanted to share with you guys is that uh, a lot of the um, footage that you see of the helicopter, if you've seen some of the success, well, it, it looks kind of like this. And uh, I just wanted to talk you through a little bit about it. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, the uh, uh, test of the helicopter in a vacuum chamber. Because remember, the Mars atmosphere is so thin that we actually had to simulate that by pulling all out of the, the air out of a room to, to really actually get uh, an accurate representation. Uh, you can see here the helicopter uh, moves upward, so it makes this climb. It's able to turn and move before returning to an initial position and then landing once more. Now, again, this is how we knew to the best of our ability that this would be a successful flight uh, when it did reach Mars and reached conditions similar to this. Um, but as much as I am impressed by this video, I sometimes worry that it kind of paints a picture of, uh, it makes it look like this was so easy, right? And that this is, this is what the helicopter's first flight looked like. Um, and I really wanna encourage you guys to understand that when we do these types of tests, the lead up is much, much uglier. So while this video suggests uh, everything went so smoothly, and what a nice soft landing, instead, the initial flight looked something like this. So you can see here, uh, far less control, uh, a little less graceful uh, as we're just kind of bouncing around. And here in these early phases, we were really trying to understand how to even control flight. Would it be a person who is actually kind of uh, manually operating it, or would it have to, to run off code? Uh, and as you can see, the ability to even just hover, to be able to just kind of take off and, and hold position, completely gone, and in fact, uh, ends with the destruction of the helicopter. So, uh, you know, again, to, to students, especially in coding, coding is one of the toughest things to do because you fail so many times. It just, it never goes right the first time. It never goes right the hundredth time. Um, and I think the helicopter, we spent six years putting this together before it really reached, uh, uh, you know, a, a level of success that we felt safe sending. So, you know, again, please, please don't be discouraged when your activity doesn't go right, um, when, you know, you, you kind of make mistakes because it's going to happen and the coding is going to have bugs and you're going to have to uh, improvise from there. But the end result is you get a video just like Lyle mentioned, where on Mars, you can actually see uh, the uh, the first flight of the helicopter and as it lifts and just like Lyle said, starting with a nice basic flight, get to a certain position and then head back down. Uh, and this is when we had demonstrated again, that first powered flight. So it can be done. It takes some time, but you can really do some, some amazing things. So uh, with that, maybe I'll turn back over to Lyle and see uh, how we're doing on the coding section. All right, great. So what I am going to do is I'm going to share some sample code uh, it is not complete, but it does have the blocks that you'll need. And we'll talk about what those blocks are and what um, they do and why you need them and even how to put them together. 
So we've got a few different blocks over here. And if you're not familiar with Scratch or any of the other block coding languages that are out there, they're color coded, which makes it nice and easy to find them because they're sorted by what they do or how they operate or, or how you can use them. So you'll notice over on the side, you've got the dark blue motion blocks and the purple looks blocks. Um, all of those do different things. And the first thing that I like to do with a lot of different coding activities is to start with this green flag button. And you'll notice that color matches the, um, if you look over here, the events block, that's where you'll be able to find it. Um, and you can just click and drag it over to the screen here. I've already done it, but that's where you'll find it. And that, you can think of that as um, if you're used to playing video games, when you hit start, that's how it might go. Um, if you've been to an arcade and you put a quarter in a machine, that's sort of like what's happening here. Or in the case of the helicopter on Mars, when it receives its commands and the time for those commands to execute to execute those commands comes, then you can think of this as sort of like this is the, the start. Now, one thing that a lot of people, when they're first getting into coding, don't think about is the idea of uh, how frequently a program is checking for commands. And it's always checking for a command. And if that command isn't being given, it, it just doesn't do it because it doesn't know what to do. So this block right here, um, and I kind of like to think of these as like, um, I don't know, alligators that, that could eat something because they kind of look like the, the mouth from the side maybe. Um, but this one right here is called a forever loop. And that what, what that means is whatever I put inside of here, it's going to be doing uh, or the, the command is going to be running forever. And that's pretty useful for um, when I want instantaneous response to something. So um, in the case of this one, when I press the green flag on this button, and you'll notice there's the green flag over here, that's sort of like my start button. When I press the green flag, whatever I put in here is always going to be happening. Now, sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you just want something to happen right at the beginning, and that's totally fine too. Um, but in this particular case, we do want that to happen. Uh, and the next important block to talk about is what's called an if-then statement. And that's sort of like cause and effect. So think about um, when you've talked about cause and effect. If something happens, then something else happens. That's what an if-then statement is. So if something happens, something else will happen in the code. And in this particular case, we want the something that's going to cause something else to happen to be how you control the helicopter. So this is, again, You've got an alligator eating another alligator. So you can pop these blocks into each other and you can get pretty complex in order for this to happen. So the next thing that I'll do is, what do I actually want to happen? You'll notice there's an empty um, hexagon here. And what's nice about a lot of these block coding languages is that the shapes tell you what can or cannot go in there. So in this case, I'm looking for an input. That's what I'm going to put into the command um, or into the programming or into the video game. In this case, what do I want the key that I press to be? So in this case, um, you'll notice this kind of light bluish block here. Um, I pulled this out of the sensing. So um, in this case, we're pressing a key. So the program is sensing that we've uh, pressed a key. And we're just going to drag that block right into this hexagon. And you'll see it glows, works very nicely. And here's a little trick. This is a hint for uh, what your next steps are. Um, you can pick any key from your key. Oops. Let me see if I can get this to scroll correctly. There we go. You can cl click from this list whatever key you want. Because my helicopter is on the ground and I want it to go up, just like we saw in the video, uh, I'm going to start with the up arrow. And then I need, I need a little bit more information because at this point, my computer, when it runs this program, it's going to say, OK, my green button's been clicked forever, I'm going to be looking to see if the game player or the helicopter operator is pressing the up arrow, but I need to tell it what to do. And that's where this purple block comes in pretty handy. That's kind of purplish blue, I guess. Um, kind of hard to tell on the screen. It, it may look a little different for you too. Um, but essentially what this is, is this is telling us to change. And this is where it gets a little tricky. If you're familiar with some higher level math that you might learn in middle school, um, you might know about X and Y. But in this case, you can think of Y as up and down and X as left and right. And since we want to go up and down, we're looking for Y, which is where we get. And 
we are going to drag that right into our alligator mouth. Now I put in the number one, you could put in 10, you could put in 100, different things will happen. So I encourage you to experiment and play around. But what I'm gonna do now is test my code. And this is something that's pretty important and gets what Brandon was saying before in terms of how long it took to test the helicopter and how much failure there was along the way. We don't get it right the first time every time. And so um, testing your code is really important. So I'm gonna hit the green arrow. My code is now running. I can see it's glowing yellow. That's what that outline is. If I press up on my key, sure enough, my helicopter is moving up. Success, we've got a flight. So this is where I'm gonna leave you with this challenge, but I'm stuck in the air. Oh, I am flying. Oh, you know what? I am, I forgot. I actually cheated a little bit. I coded in a little bit more, but it's off screen so you can't see it. Um, if you put this block in, all you'll be able to do is fly up. So you'll need to figure out how to then go back down to the ground. Um, so again, that is part one of the challenge that I linked to in the chat. So there are a lot more challenges to add, and this is only the first step moving up on that first challenge set. So um, we'll give you an opportunity to look through those uh, challenge steps and do a little bit more. Um, again, they're on that website that I linked in the chat. So you've got the Code of Mars helicopter game here. Um, and we are already past the setup stage, um, but really we are at make the helicopter fly. And that's what you're gonna finish up with and then move on to things like adding a location for takeoff and landing uh, because we wanna be able to control our helicopter as much as possible. All right, so um, with that, I think we've probably got some time for questions maybe. Yeah. All right, so um, let's take a look in the chat. If you've got questions about the helicopter, um, let me stop this share so I can go back to us here. All right, um, if you've got questions about coding or the helicopter, boy, my mouse is just all over the place right now. Where are we? Here we go, okay, there we go. All right, and somewhere we have a chat screen. All right, so we've got a couple of different questions already. Thanks so much. Uh, first one, ah, this is a great one. Uh, does it have a battery or how will it keep running? This is a good question. Uh, do you want to answer this one? Well, let me pull up a slide and I'll, you, if you want to answer, I'll be able to show the All right. picture. So yes, it does have a battery, um, but it's a small battery. That helicopter is lightweight. We can't have it be too heavy. And so as a result, there is a solar panel that you can see right on top there. And that solar panel is used to convert energy from the sun into power for the battery. And then once the battery is charged up, we're able to fly the helicopter. Now we can't run the helicopter for a long time because it's such a small battery. I think we can get um, a couple of minutes of flight tops, um, but that's enough for us to get up. And you can see this chart in terms of how we can look around and fly around and move around, either coming back to where we originally took off from or landing in a new location. So um, yes, we do have batteries on board and they are charged up by solar power. Excellent question. Yeah, and you can see that uh, even though the flights are getting more and more complex, that we are being able to go further, faster, higher. At any point, we do know the maximum amount of distance and height we can cover before needing to land again and recharge. Um, I see a, uh, a couple of questions. Oh my God, there's so many, that's awesome. Um, so what, uh, what motivated you to keep trying to, to make the helicopter? And, and yeah, I mean, it, it really is just a wild idea. I think um, if you guys have seen some of the, the missions that have come out of JPL, they, they all kind of take this tone, which is, you know, just these really, really crazy ideas um, that push the, the forefront of, of how you um, can further explore space. And I, I think that's kind of the answer in itself is you look at, you know, sky crane technology for landing with uh, uh, curiosity and perseverance. These were crazy ideas, too. And uh, I think that's the motivation in itself, right? Is what is the next big thing that is seems just just wild, but if we could do it, if we could pull it off, would really change the game. We actually have a sign in the lobby of this building um, that sort of encourages us, us to try these wild ideas that maybe nobody has ever done before. And um, we 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 kind of think about those things when we're we're doing that. And that that motto is dare mighty things, and we try to think of what. What sort of things can we think of together to do things that no one has ever done before? Um, so I love that question. And it, it's kind of a nice reminder of, um, you know, the impossible is only impossible until you do it. 
Uh, lots of great questions coming in. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to kind of scroll back up because I thought I saw one that uh, what language was mainly used? This is a good one. I can answer part of that question because I don't know if I know what coding language was used for the helicopter, but I know uh, one of the languages, one of the primary languages used on the rover was uh, C++. Um, so we use a lot of that. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking around for a few minutes. Uh, we just had our internet go out. Um, so uh, I, unfortunately, oh boy, I hope I can find the chat here. Uh-oh. It looks like we lost some of the questions. So uh, I apologize um, if you want to start putting in questions. We probably got a few more minutes left. Um, but I think we were talking about the sequence of commands. And essentially what the rover does, or what the team does, is once it finalizes those commands, it sends that list of commands to the rover, the rover gets them, and when it wakes up in the morning, so when it gets that green flag clicked button almost, um, it goes through those lists of commands. Um, and just like you, if you're having a problem with one of the things that your teacher might assign to you, it gets to that spot and says, hey, I, I need some help. I don't know what to do. So um, that is essentially how we, we code that rover and command the rover. So um, again, I apologize for the, um, the little hang up there. Um, let's see. All right. So looks like we've got some more questions coming into the chat. Thank you so much for resubmitting them again. Um, oh, this is a tough one. I like this one. It's worth, worth asking, though. What happens if the helicopter gets damaged or ruined? Do you want to get? Do you want to give the bad news? Yeah, I mean, you know, we 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 hope against hope, right? And uh, you know, if 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 it does happen, you know, again, remember that this was what we call a a, a proof of concept. This was a pilot. This is the first time we've ever tried a technology like this. So if if it does get damaged or wound, let's not forget that we we really already learned so so much. Um, so we expect eventually, of course, it will get damaged or it will get ruined. It, the the goal is not to fly it forever. Um, but kind of uh, similar to a question I see from um, Ms. Steele's class that, you know, from what we've learned already, maybe we could use this on other planets or other moons as well. So maybe we could send more than one. Maybe we could have a, a fleet of little scout helicopters in the future. So um, if something were to happen to the helicopter in the future, you know, while we want to collect as much data as we can, uh, again, the, the lessons learned are already going to shape future missions. I like this question coming in. Um, can the helicopter detect life on Mars? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, it was not designed to do that. It was designed to uh, demonstrate whether or not we could fly on Mars because we really didn't know if that was possible. Now, the rover, however, Perseverance, is designed to look for signs of life, what we call biosignatures. And um, it's collecting samples that will be deposited on the surface and collected by a future mission to be brought back to Earth. And we can look for those biosignatures in those samples. Um, so the helicopter is not designed to do that. Um, so it, it really just flies, has cameras to help us uh, look around the environment to see places where we might want to drive or avoid driving if it's too dangerous. Um, but no, no, no life detection for the helicopter. But you can imagine perhaps in the future, um, we can broaden the amount of tools and the capabilities of the helicopter. So now we know we can fly. What else could we do moving forward? Could we have like, um, you know, like an arcade claw machine? What if we could pick up samples and bring them back to the rover? Um, you know, traversing the Martian terrain like we saw from the wheels in the earlier slides is really, really difficult. It's very, very slow moving. So being able to hop over some of those difficult spots and maybe bring samples of interest back, that would be something really interesting. Now, of course, we're, we're weight limited and there are um, other features that you know, we need to consider. But uh, again, we're, we're off to such a great start uh, because we did this, this wild and crazy uh, imaginative idea. So who knows what's next? I think a good example of how that happens is the rovers themselves. We started in 1997 with our first rover. It was about this big. And um, we just wanted to see, can we drive on another planet? Uh, that, was, that was the technology demonstration. And we were able to. And from there, scientists and engineers thought, well, what can we do if we build the bigger rover? 
with more science capability. So we got Spirit and Opportunity, which were bigger and they lasted many, many years. Then from there, we got the um, Curiosity rover, which has now been on Mars for over 10 years, and the Perseverance rover, which has been on Mars for over a year. So the capabilities um, that we can add on to, to these technology demonstrations really, really, really um, improve the way that we can conduct science on these remote locations. Uh, and maybe just time for one more question. I, I saw um, that question, does Mars have the same types of minerals as Earth? Uh, and in a, in a very interesting way, the answer is yes. Um, I think sometimes we want to see something different, but let me perhaps uh, uh, kind of encourage you that seeing something that's the same is actually more exciting because that tells us that Mars was very much like Earth, at least in its formation, uh, in some of its geological history, and perhaps, perhaps as a result, could have also hosted life. We know there was water on Mars. We know that there's still water on Mars uh, in a much different shape, but there was a wet period at Mars as well. So we know that there was standing water. Lakes and oceans are, are, are very strongly evidenced. So if this is the case, what better place to look for life? Um, so the fact that there are so many similarities in the geology is actually, I think, a, a really a good sign for what it is that we're looking for. Yeah, I think that's a great question to end on, and I think you, you answered it very well. So thanks for that. And thanks for all of your questions. These are really good questions. Um, nice to be able to think of that, uh, these questions in sort of a, a new and fresh way from all of you um, students out there who are coming up with these ideas. So um, thanks so much for your time today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed learning about the helicopter and um, have a little bit of incentive or excitement going forward on these challenges. Um, and best of luck with these challenges. Brandon, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, please tell your teachers, uh, you know, uh, share your awesome projects with us, send them our way so we can see how successful you coded. Uh, maybe maybe learn a thing or two for our, for our next uh, uh, helicopter mission. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.